Just prior to the Lord ascending back up into heaven and uh, leaving, when he did that, leaving the promise that he was going to come again. He left with that great promise, I will come again. Okay, but as he, just before he did that, he, he gathered his disciples around them and he gave them what we call the Great Commission. He told them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, making disciples of them, baptizing them, them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so with that, we have that great commission. Now, that's in the, and we're going to look at that one first in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, but also in all the Gospels, all four Gospels, there is a form of the great commission. It's just a little bit different in the four Gospel accounts, but there, the great commission is there. Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever, uh, from the time maybe that you first trusted the Lord as personal Savior, and maybe even sometimes now, you know that the Lord has given you that command, uh, but sometimes you're just a little bit timid or maybe just a little bit afraid of trying to tell somebody else about Jesus? Come on now. All of us, I think, from time to time, we've just been a little bit shy about that. Sometimes we, we have a fear. We have fears about sharing Jesus sometimes with other people. We're afraid that we may offend them. We're afraid that we may say the wrong thing. We're afraid that we may not have the right scriptures. And just on and on and on, uh, we are afraid. Well, the Bible in these four accounts uh, of, this, of the gospel, uh, of the great uh, commission in the gospel uh, accounts, uh, Jesus actually attaches a promise. Are we aware of that? He actually attaches a promise to each and every one of the, of the Great Commission, the way he puts it in each of the four Gospels, he attaches a little bit different promise to each one. And so if we will look at those promises and if we'll take those pop promises to heart and if we'll allow them, guess what? Our fears of witnessing for Jesus will be taken away. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to be a perfect witness, <laughs> okay? doesn't mean that I am. But it's a, it's a way that the Lord has given us help that can help us through these times and help us to, to, uh, to be the witnesses that he wants us to be. Now, let's look at them. First of all, in Matthew chapter 28, and of course, the Great Commission there begins with verse 19. And Jesus says, and we'll stop after that second word. He says, go, therefore. Now, what have I always taught you in the last eight years? At least, anytime you see the word, therefore, in the scriptures, what do you need to do? Go back and see what the word therefore is there for. <laughs> All right. So let's look at verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. And so Jesus is saying that he has the authority. Would you agree? He has the authority to give us that command. Amen. He has the authority to give us that command because he completed his plan for what he was supposed to do. Born of a virgin, grew up perfect, sinless life, all kinds of miracles, died on the cross of Calvary, raised victorious over the tomb, and appeared to his disciples for 40 days. He's getting ready to ascend back up into heaven. He has absolutely completed what the Father sent him to do. Okay, so he has the authority to tell us what we need to do. <laughs> right? Upon his departure, he has that authority to tell us what we ought to do. One of the things that we... Uh, that we did this morning. Cash got these on Amazon, I think. Got some WW, uh, uh, what would Jesus do? JD, WWJD. Okay, he got some bracelets. How many got a bracelet this morning? Okay, okay, we got some, but we know we put some in the youth room and we put some in the children's uh, room, Sunday school classroom, because at school they can wear those school and that, what a great witness uh, that is. Some adults can get uh, some too. But Jesus has the authority to tell us that we need to go into all the world and, uh, and preach uh, the gospel. Now, let's watch this. He says, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We have seen part of that this morning, haven't we? We've seen part of that great commission fulfilled this morning. Here's two uh, young men that trusted Jesus as personal Savior, and they followed the Lord in believer's baptism. So we've experienced that. It says, now, teaching them to observe all things uh, whatsoever I have commanded you. And so after a, at, when a person is saved, uh, then they are a disciple of the Lord, and they're to grow, learn more about the Lord. That's what Sunday school uh, is all about. And so they need to be in Sunday school, need to be in the, in, the, in, the, in the Word of God and growing. But now watch this. He says, and lo, I am with you 
always, even to the end of the world or the end of the age. And so there is the first promise. The first account we have of the Great Commission, there is the first one. Did, did you get it? It is the promise of His presence. The promise of His presence. Now, we know some things in looking at the Bible. We know some things about uh, the presence of the Lord and how the Lord did that. And going again all the way back to His birth. Uh, remember that uh, Matthew, uh, as he started his gospel, he talked about the birth of Jesus. And he talked about when that announcement was given, he said, You shall call his name Jesus. And then he quoted the book of, of Isaiah, said, Thou shalt call his name what? Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So we, we know from there that he's, that, he's, that he's with us. Amen? And so with us, but he gives us this command that more than just, well, we know God's here, but he gives us a command that, that as we go uh, sharing Jesus that he's with us. Now, we know also that the Bible teaches us that he is for us. We know that Jesus died on the cross of Calvary for us. The wages of sin is what? Death, but the gift of eternal life is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay, so I deserve to die for my sins. You do too. Everybody here, we deserve to die for our own sins. We deserve to die and go to hell for our sins. Amen? But he took our place so we wouldn't have to. So he is for us. And then in the little book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 27, the apostle Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So we know also, uh, and, and we see that taking, uh, taking place when the, at the birth of the New Testament church, when God gives the Holy Spirit, we know from that time on the Holy Spirit indwells us. Amen? So, He promises that He's with us, and, he prom and here is that extension of that just promise that He's here with us, that, that He's everywhere present and all that. He says that I'm going to be with you when you witness. I'm going to be with you when you tell other people about Jesus. And so, folks, listen, if, if we know that he's with us, should we have any fear? Come on now. Should we have any fear that we know when we know that he is with us? Shouldn't have any fear, right? Well, you guys, are you guys okay this morning? <laughs> I hope. Okay. Uh, so now we're going to look at the next one. And that's found, of course, Matthew and then Mark. Uh, look in the last chapter of Mark, Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 18. Now, we're, we just looked at this passage. We just looked at this passage of Scripture uh, on, uh, on Wednesday nights because we're, we're going through a study of the Holy Spirit and we're talking about gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the last week, we, well, actually, we've, we speak, we've uh, taken two or three weeks uh, talking about tongues. Okay, and so first mention of it here is in the Gospel of Mark. Okay, so that's why we were looking at it on, on Wednesday nights. And uh, I, want, we're gonna, we're, I want to read these verses, and then I'm going to show you something. <clears throat> and he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So there it is. There's that, that uh, repetition of that great commission. He's given the great commission. Go into all the world preach the gospel. He who believes, key word believes, okay, he who believes and is baptized, will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. So if a person doesn't trust Jesus Christ as personal Savior, it doesn't mean they join a certain church or anything like that. They must believe in Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way. He is the, Jesus is the only way to go to heaven. Jesus is the only way to have a relationship with God. It's through Jesus. If you could do it any other way, some people think, well, if I, 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 I just, in fact, I heard just this week, one person I heard said, well, I hope I'm good enough to go to heaven. Well, I can tell you right now, nobody's good enough. Amen. There was only one person that was good enough, and he's already there, and that's Jesus. Only one person didn't need a Savior. That's our Savior, Jesus himself. So if a person doesn't receive Jesus, they condemn themselves. They go to a devil's hell if they do not receive Jesus before they leave this life. Now, watch verse 17. He says, and these signs will follow those who believe. Key word there, follow. Key word is follow. These signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. And, uh, and they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So there's a list of five things 
okay, that, that will follow those who believe. It's not that you seek for something like this. It's that back then, folks, when this was taking place, we didn't have the written word. The, the New Testament had not been canonized. We didn't have that written word. And so these signs were following them, a confirmation of Jesus. It was a confirmation of the living word who is Jesus. He's the living word, Logos, living word. So it's a confirmation of him in absence of the written word of which we have now. Now, I want to show you that in each one of these things, they have all been fulfilled. Okay, there's only one, only one. All of these have been, were fulfilled in the book of Acts, in fact, except this one thing. And I want to say something about that when we get down to it. Okay? So when, when you look at these things, uh, he says, uh, in my name, they will, uh, they will cast out demons. They did that. The apostles did that in, in the New Testament. Uh, he says, they will speak with new tongues. On the day of Pentecost, they spoke languages that other people heard, understood. 3,000 people were saved. They even heard in their own, not only just their own language, but in their own dialect. We talked a little bit about that Wednesday. It's, a, it's amazing, isn't it, this word dialect? All of us are from southeast Missouri. Now, we don't really think about any of us have any sort of different dialect than anybody else uh, in different parts, even of our own state. But you go to some places in our state, and uh, people have different dialect. Amen? They talk differently. I, I, I talked about that Wednesday night. In fact, my cousins grew up in St. Louis, and uh, they talk weird. They're little, little, they'd come and visit us, and uh, we all said, yuns and y'all. I say y'all. What do you all say? Y'all? Okay. And, but some people say yuns. You ever hear anybody say that? You said yuns? Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, they said yous. And I felt like saying, I don't see any sheep around here. <laughs> but they would say, instead of saying yuns or y'all, they said yous. Yous do this or yous do that. And so different, it was a different, that's St. Louis dialect. Now, uh, we, a lot of us old uh, Southern people have migrated to St. Louis. <laughs> and now that dialect has all changed up there. I don't hear anybody up there anymore saying use. Uh, a lot of our people, anyway, uh, the, the different dialect. Now, then he says, uh, they will take up serpents. And, uh, and it said, then he says, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. They lay, they lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So all of those things were fulfilled in the book of Acts, except one thing. Now, and this one thing, this is what I want to point out with this, too. We, we got going on this. Marge uh, uh, mentioned this the other night. We didn't have enough time to spend on that. But she brought out a, a very good point because there is a key word in that passage, and the word is if. Okay? And so the point is, this promise, did, did you get it in, in hearing these things? And uh, especially when you think about a person getting snake bit. Was that fulfilled in the New Testament? It certainly was. On the island of Malta, remember the, the Apostle Paul was putting one on the fire, and there's an old snake grabbed a hold of his arm, or he, and, and, uh, and he raised it up, he, he held on, he just shook him off like that, and didn't harm, didn't harm him. <laughs> I'm here to tell you, okay? If a snake grabs a hold of my hand, I'm not just going to shake him off, I'm going to take off running. <laughs> hey, man? I'm going to find out where the nearest hospital is at. I'm just taking off running. I'm going to get out of there, man. I've got to find something that's going to be an antidote for this, whatever this was that the snake put in me, this venom. Okay, but it didn't hurt Paul. Well, they thought, wow, this guy must be a god himself. They tried to worship him. He said, no, I'm, I'm not. I want to tell you about him, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not him. Now, so with that, and also the key word if, now, now watch this. When you look at these, these signs will follow them. He says, in my name, they will cast out demons. In my will, or in, in my name, they will speak in tongues. They will take up serpents. Okay, and then also it says, uh, uh, they will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Okay, there's all, just that one thing, drinking the deadly poison doesn't say they will. Okay, it doesn't say they will. All, everything else, four things, says they will do this, they will do that, and they did it. But here's the point. It says, if they drink any deadly poison, it will not harm them. So what is the promise? The promise is the promise of protection. The promise of protection. Now, isn't that amazing? The Lord says, if you go out into all the world and you preach the gospel, I will protect you. Now, you think about going out here in the streets of Oran and, and uh, Cape Girardeau and Chaffee and all these places. That's one thing. 
But think about going to a foreign mission field and think about all the things that go on on the foreign mission field. Think about all the snakes there and think about the people that hate Christianity there. The Lord says, if you do my will, I will protect you. And now watch this. I believe, the Bible says this, Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. Okay, so we all have an appointment with death, and only God knows when that appointment is. Amen? Folks, we have seen young people pass away. We've, we've, seen, we've seen tragic accidents. We, we've seen all this, and many, much of it is so hard for us to understand. But I believe this. I believe if you are witnessing for the Lord Jesus Christ, he will, not, he will, he will let no harm come to you until it's time. That appointed time. Are you listening? Apart from that, the devil, the world, whatever, and anyone that can try to do whatever to you, but God is going to protect you until it's his time for him to call you home. And we don't know when that is, but he will protect you. What, have you, what are you afraid of? I think, obviously, there are many people, Phyllis is scared to death of snakes. And I found out Shirley is too. Shirley Mason, she's, she didn't like those snakes either. She wanted me to kill a snake out, out on her walk the other day, and I hate it. By the time I got back out there, that old snake was gone. But I think probably most of us are afraid of snakes. All right? Some more than others. Some just, you know, if it's a black snake, that's good. Black snake not going to hurt anything. Chicken snake, king snake, they kill other snakes. But a lot of people are really afraid of snakes. Well, listen, if you go out and start telling other people about Jesus, you know what your greatest danger probably will be? Probably won't be dogs. I mean, I'm sorry, I, I, I overlapped it then. It probably won't be snakes. It will be dogs. Everybody, are you? I had a, a good buddy of mine one time that was breaking, that used to break horses for us. And uh, he said, now you always need to remember this. Every dog will bite <laughs> and every horse will kick. Meaning you got to respect all of them because you never know when they're going to turn on. There's a guy, preacher, Jerry Vines, Dr. Jerry Vines, used to be a president of the, of the Southern Baptist Convention. He confesses that was his greatest fear. When I was a kid, he said, I was always taught that if there's a dog and that dog is growling at you and that dog acts like he wants to bite you, just look him in the eyes. <laughs> he said, just look him in the eyes. Get him looking at you in the eyes. He said, that dog won't bother you. So he said he came across a big old dog one day. <laughs> and he said he just, he just kept staring, tried to stare that dog down. He said he just kept getting closer. That dog just kept growling. <laughs> He said, all of a sudden, he said, that dog took a leap and went for my throat. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Somebody was there to pull him off of me. Okay. So he said, from that time, I'm, I've always been afraid of dogs. We have, the, we have the ups truck pull up in front of our house. A lot of them know Sasha. Okay. But I can always tell if there's a new driver. The new driver won't get out. <laughs> the new driver will stay in the truck and uh, sometimes honk their horn or we see it uh, that it's out there, whatever. We got to go outside Will that dog bite? <laughs> nah, she's just a pushover. She's a big pet. But I don't convince that person of that until I walk out there with Sasha. Say, oh, she's a good dog. So most of them, they've, they've gotten used to that. By the way, she's, she's only about, she's, she's about like the size of Tracker, except she's heavier. But she's probably about that tall. But she wouldn't, uh, she wouldn't bite. I don't think she'd bite anybody unless you maybe if you try to hurt Phyllis or me, she might she might take up the sword then, uh, but other than that, but listen, we don't, and I know it's tough, and, uh, and sometimes, you know, when you think sometimes about, I heard this, uh, we think about going out, sharing Jesus with people, a lot of times the best thing for us to take with us, not a gun, <laughs> but to take a New Testament, right? We can stick a New Testament in our, in our pocket, and we can take that New Testament pretty well anywhere we go, but I have discovered sometimes a good weapon Against dogs is a big Bible. <laughs> you don't want to beat the person you're witnessing to. You don't want to beat them over the head with the Bible. Amen? You don't want to try to force them uh, into anything. But boy, you can sure enough use that big Bible and force it on that dog. <laughs> so, here, here's my advice on that. Number one, don't be afraid. God's going to protect you. Okay? And, uh, and number two, if you're, uh, if you're going out like that, you're going to see somebody, you can have your New Testament in your pocket but you may want to have a big Bible in the car <laughs> or a truck. And when you get out, be looking for dogs. Sometimes they'll, they'll sneak up on you. But my point is that God will protect us. As we are visiting, as we are sharing the gospel, 
with people that need to hear the gospel, the Lord is going to pray. Or the Lord is going to take care of us. He's going to protect us. Now, isn't that a good promise? Hello. Yeah. He's going. I don't know if I could take you out on a visitation right now or not. <laughs> not going to be afraid, right? right. All right. The Lord is. He's always going to protect us. Okay. So now we're next. We're ready for the next one. That's in Luke. We're going through the gospel accounts and looking at the Great Commission. So uh, Luke chapter uh, 24, Luke chapter 24, Luke 24, let's look at verses 46 through 48. We're going to get another promise here too. You know, wouldn't you, uh, you have uh, difficulty perhaps if a, uh, if a person was wanting you to do something, but you really weren't clear. Let's, let's, let's put it this way. You start a new job tomorrow, okay? And on that job, don't you want people to kind of tell you what you're supposed to be doing and how you're supposed to start, how you're supposed to go about it? Isn't that good? Yeah. You, you, we, all, we all need that. You just can't, unless you've had a lot of experience, you just can't jump in and start in on something. You need, And even then, you may not be doing it like the new people want you to do it, <laughs> right? So we need, we need to be guided about what we do. Well, here is the promise to us that Jesus is, in fact, helping us he's guiding us because he gives us he gives us the program look at verse 46 then he said to them thus it is written and thus it was necessary for the christ to suffer and to rise from the uh, to rise from the dead the third day and that repentance by the way boy that this this thing sitting here if you wonder why I'm uh, moving around a little bit, that light hits that thing and it's got half my Bible shaded here. <laughs> okay? He says, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name to all nations. Here it is now. Beginning at Jerusalem. Beginning at Jerusalem. So here is the promise. I'm giving you the program. I'm telling you where to start. <laughs> we start at Jerusalem. That's where he told them to start. He also does the same thing in Acts uh, chapter 1 and verse 8 there. So we know that we're to start here. Now, if I were to ask you the, the question today, well, I know I'm supposed to witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. I get that, and I get that on, on the Great Commission. And, uh, but for me to start, probably when you say Jerusalem, are you talking about Oran? And I'm going to say this. It even comes a little bit back, it comes a little bit farther back than that. It starts in your own home. Amen. Amen? It starts in your home. You're Jerusalem first. You can't witness to a lost world if you're not witnessing and, and making sure that within your own household, people are coming to know Jesus as their personal Savior. The Bible teaches us to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So it starts with us. Now, Phyllis and I, of course, have two children. And uh, everybody's met both of them. You've seen Sherry a whole lot more than you've seen Darren. And, uh, but both kids, well, listen, we were not perfect parents. I don't know of any perfect parents. Do you? Mary and Joseph were pretty close. <laughs> but I don't know of any perfect parents. Uh, we do our best, don't we, to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And I think about our two. One, uh, Darren was saved when he was eight. And uh, Sherry was saved when she was nine. But what happens when they, when they grow up and they marry someone or more? <laughs> they get married. And, uh, and with that, their children, our grandchildren come along. And if you live as long as Phyllis and me and as long as some other people here, then you begin to get what kind of grandchildren? Great grandchildren. Preached the funeral of a lady Friday. She had, I think it's, it was in the 40s of great-grandchildren. She had 15 great-great-grandchildren. <clears throat> and so, in fact, and, you know, when, when you think about that, and you think about Jerusalem, and Jerusalem starting at home, folks, listen, I, I think that just extends. It's our kids first, then it's our grandkids, it's our great-grandkids, it's our, you know, if we live long enough to have great great it's, it's our responsibility to tell them about Jesus. Amen? I told a fellow just, just recently, I said, your family 
uh, uh, that just uh, may be where your ministry is at. Because he has a big family. So this may be where your ministry is at, extended family. And so it starts there. Amen? One guy told me here a while back that he, he, he went by a church that used to be open, and now the only ones going there is just uh, the pastor, his wife, and one other lady. They're the only ones going there. And this guy that told me about this used to be a deacon in that church. He met the pastor's wife one day, and he said, I, I'd like to see this church come back. And so Phyllis and I were talking. We know him very well, and we know of his family situation. And I said, if he would, if he would minister to his own family, they could get a pretty good crowd back in the church pretty quick. <laughs> Just be a witness to your own family. Think about this for a second. Even in the, in the area right here, now my family is, is scattered out. Most of them are, you know, they're not living in the area. Most of them are in uh, Evansville, Indiana. And I'm not sure, but I doubt that they'd come to church here every Sunday. <laughs> okay, I don't, I don't think they're going to fly down or drive down, even on Saturday night and spend the night to come to church here. And a lot of the grandkids and so forth and so on. But I've got others, extended family, and you all have family and extended family in this area. Can you imagine? And think about this for a second. Some of your family that you know, some of them are perhaps lost, unchurched, or maybe they're, they've drifted from the Lord. Can you imagine? Folks, listen, if you would get them all to come to church, we couldn't see them. <laughs> hey, man, that's like people ask me from time to time. Preachers ask, well, how many people, how many members you got at First Baptist Soar? And I said, well, if I, when I tell you, it's going to be a misleading figure. <laughs> I, said, I said, we've got probably over 300 uh, members. If they'd all show up one Sunday, I don't know what we'd do with them. I said, one thing that would happen, the preacher would have a heart attack. <laughs> if I would see 300 people. If I'd see 300 people here some Sunday morning, I'd probably just keel over. You guys had to be looking for a minister, for a, for a new pastor right away. No, I'd be shouting all over glory. Amen? Or shouting all over the, the, the area here. But what I'm saying is, man, if we could just reach our own families and extended families, look what the Lord could do. And then uh, with that, and then extended beyond that, the town of Orion. And some people say, <clears throat> well, the town of Orion is a, it's a predominantly Catholic community. I understand that. But guess what? They're not all Catholic. Amen? The Catholic Church has been here for a long time. And I'm getting ready to send the, the, uh, uh, the priest at, at Guardian Angel over here, getting ready to send him a letter thanking for the participation in Bible school and for their young people that made professions of faith in Bible school. And again, so thankful for how all the churches uh, work together. But folks, I got a hold of a bulletin here a while back. And I looked at that bulletin. I think it was back in the 60s. Back in the 60s. That there was like a hundred. It seems like that uh, somebody can, can help me with this. Because this has been a while since I looked at it. <clears throat> but it was well over. I was thinking it was somewhere around 160. That had to be a full house. Amen. But it was well over 100. Can anybody give me a better figure? Back in the, anybody here back in the 60s? How many were you running? Yeah, Sunday school rooms full. Guess what? All the other churches were here back then too. Folks, we can't be concerned what other churches do. We, gotta, we need to be concerned what we do. Amen? We need to reach people. He has called us to reach people, and he has given us the program to do it. <clears throat> now, with this program, uh, one of the things that, that, uh, that we notice in, in looking at the New Testament, there is a, uh, there's a public presentation and there's personal presentation the public yeah it's on sunday mornings wednesday nights vacation bible school i gotta tell you all about this experience i told the sunday school class a little bit about it. i'm so excited about it i feel almost like uh peter felt on the day of pentecost and when he went to corinth and preached <laughs> he had to tell them about what took place at pentecost at the funeral i did friday most unusual. I just felt led to do it. Just felt led to do it. <clears throat> there was another guy that was preaching after me. He was from a different denomination. And so what I did, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but uh, I'll tell you the last part of it. I, uh, I challenged the people, used, the, used the, uh, the little poem, Make Me a Promise. First of all, talked about this lady that had passed away. <clears throat> and... Uh, she asked me many times to pray for you all. Different ones are here. I have prayed for you all before. 
And I think, and I said, so today, read that poem, make me a promise. I said, you need to make her a promise today that you're going to see her again. And there's only one way to see her. That's through Jesus. And so I said, in a moment, <clears throat> I'm going to pray. And when I pray, at the end of my prayer, I'm going to pray what we call the sinner's prayer. And if you'll pray this prayer and you really, really mean it, you can ask Jesus to come into your life and he will do that. I said, but the Lord tells us that if we confess him before men, he'll confess us before the Father. But if we deny him before men, he'll deny us before the Father. So I said, here's your challenge. I'm going to be standing at the head of the casket. And when you come around and you take my hand, you shake my hand. If you prayed that prayer, you tell me that you prayed that prayer. And so I'm standing at the head of the casket. And uh, the other uh, preacher, he's standing at the foot of the casket. And so when, a, when people started coming around, there hadn't been but just a few had come around. He left his post. <laughs> he left his post, and he came down to me. He said, that lady just told me. <laughs> that lady just told me that she prayed that prayer. I said, well, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Well, other people started coming through. Everybody, or not everybody, but several people came through, took me by the hand. They either said one of three things. I prayed that prayer. I'm going to keep that promise, or I renewed that promise. I'll say this. There was enough people that came through to start a church. <laughs> okay? So that's, that's public proclamation, even though it's different. And I told a couple of funeral directors before the service, I said, I'm going to do things a little bit different today. And, uh, and, and Mark, you would know probably both. Well, everybody might know uh, several of you, but I know you know Rick Weezer, right? And Rick was a funeral director, and Joe Lowe's was. And Joe said, Boy, it was different. <laughs> but I'm saying, folks, yeah, that's, that's, and I have an opportunity that, that uh, most of you all don't get. I, that, uh, standing before people like that and presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ and then giving an invitation. Normally, I don't give invitations unless we're at, at a funeral, unless we're at a church. Okay, but I didn't force anybody to anything. Just gave them the simple gospel message. You need Jesus in your life. Now, so that's public. Okay. But there's also personal, and all of you have opportunities to witness on a personal level with people. All of us have different concentric circles of people that we see. Some are neighbors. Some are people down the, uh, farther down the street. Some uh, are, are people at, at Walmart or the gas station. But you run into different people at different times. Give them a big smile. Don't ever walk on your bottom lip. <laughs> Give them a big smile and look for opportunities for them to see Jesus in you and look for opportunities to tell people about Jesus. Amen? Okay, we're going to have to hurry on uh, here. We're going to, we're going to look uh, at, uh, at one more, and uh, that's in the Gospel of John, chapter 20. The Gospel of John, chapter, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, chapter 20, and verse 21. <clears throat> Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. <clears throat> How did the Father send him? In, in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, he said, Jesus said, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So he's saying, Now I'm sending you all out to do that. I am ascending back up into heaven. I'm going to come back someday. But right now, I am sending you all out. And that you all, by the way, encompasses us, you all. Sending us out. <clears throat> now, there's that word peace. That's the promise there. Peace. Peace I leave with you. Boy, you listen. I've preached lots of sermons in my day just on the subject of peace because there's many kinds of peace that the Bible talks about. <clears throat> but here's a peace. If you are telling other people about Jesus... You're going to have peace. Now, <clears throat> that's contrary to the world system today. The world system today is look out for, come on now, you've, never, you've heard it. Look out for number one. Look out for number one. And everybody's looking inward. Suffering from narcissism. Loving self. Looking for all kinds of books on self-helps. I don't tell you what, you, you, can get, you can buy a whole bookstore full of them on self-helps. That's still not going to give you peace. Still not going to give you peace. Where does, where does peace come from? It comes from the Lord. 
And we don't need to look in. We need to look up and we need to look out. When we look up, we think about what the Apostle Paul said uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the Ephesians, chapter 1 and verse 6, that we are the accepted in the beloved. Folks, listen. Stop and think about that for a second. As a Christian, I'm accepted in the beloved. There's a great hero preacher of mine. He's in heaven now. Adrian Rogers. I saw him preach a message one night on that verse. He couldn't get over it. <laughs> Man, accepted in the beloved. Wow, he accepted me. Who am I that a king would bleed and die for? He accepted me. We should never get over that. That's where the peace begins when I realize that he accepted me into his kingdom. He accepted me to be part of his plan. And then we look out. Look out. Look at all the people that are dying and going to hell without Jesus. And we have the answer. We can tell them how to go to heaven. Let's not let the devil win any victories. Let's tell people how to get saved. Amen? So he has given us all these promises, could be called miracle promises, that he has given us. And he's, I think this peace here would be the peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, you give me that peace within my heart. I'm one of your children. Help me not to be just satisfied with my own. Help me to want to tell other people about you. And then begin to look around. Look around you and see all the people. I think, I think to, uh, either this morning, we could do it here today as we give this invitation. But I think if you would just ask the Lord to begin to lay lost people on your heart. Ask him to begin to lay lost people, their name, on your heart. And even starting with your own family, say, Lord, what about... This person, you can call them by name. What about them? And I'll tell you what's going to happen. A lot of times, you're going to come up and say, well, I don't know. I don't know if he's really saved. I don't know if she's really saved. My cousin and I stood at the <clears throat> graveside of another cousin. And both of us stood there that day. He had passed away. We're standing there over his grave. And we're asking, I wonder if he was saved. I wonder if he was a Christian. And we made a covenant that day. Let's make sure about our other cousins. Now, at that time, my other cousin, he lived in Los Angeles, California. He's now moved to White, Georgia. He's closer. <laughs> So stop and think about that. Think about the people in your family. That's my Jerusalem. I'm going to start telling them about Jesus. Don't, you don't have to worry about beating them down. Don't beat them over the head. Just let them know that you love them and look for ways to tell them how they can trust Jesus as personal Savior. And realize that when you do that, you're going to start experiencing peace. Perhaps like you've never experienced it before. Stand with me, please. <clears throat> what are we going to sing, Brother Bill? 316, number 316. That's that let's let's sing. That's got that's our invitational hymn. Ling today. Some are coming praying at this altar. Would you come?